But thinking about that, what do you think we we should hear more about? You know, so we've heard a lot about heroes. We hear a lot about yeah. you know what we can do coming together, staying at home, being safe, that kind of stuff. But what are the things that we could be talking about and hearing more about? Do you think there's lots of things actually? But I'll I'll tell you about a couple. And one of which I bet is something that students are already doing in the context of, of their classes and in their friend groups, but we could do more as a society actually. And that's, I think we should talk more about differences in how people experience the pandemic, okay? So for instance, the way you experience the pandemic in London versus people who live in the countryside is pretty different, right? For a variety of reasons. Similarly, um, during the pandemic, we had disruptions to the way that funeral practices were carried out, and that affected some communities differently to others. In particular, Jewish and Muslim communities had their ability to carry out funerals in the way that they would prefer be disrupted. This was true for everybody, but, are, but there's a specific way this, this relates to Islam and Judaism. And we don't always see that those differences experienced and, and you know that that upsets people it's sad we also need to hear about the ways in which different communities experience vulnerability to getting sick from the virus and also unfortunately dying from the virus right so uh communities who are black uh south asian or from other minority ethnic backgrounds in the uk we know from the charts from the statistics that their health risks around COVID-19 are not the same uh, as white British people. And that has big effects on communities, on families, on schools, on professions. And it's sometimes difficult to talk about these things, but it's really, really important because we need to know that the pandemic affected people in different ways. And we need, you know, we need to be understanding and to share and to remember that the way we or our family or our community experience a pandemic is not necessarily the same way that everyone did. That this is what we mean when there's lots of narratives, there's lots of experiences. Related to that, I know I've been talking for a while. The other thing I think it's important for us to talk about a lot more is grief, which is how people feel after pe people they love have died or when someone their friend loves dies, what do we do when people in our community and our lives die? It's really hard to talk about grief. It's very sad, but it's also really important. It is also something I'm guessing some of you may have figured out that adults really don't like talking about. They find it really, really difficult. We often want to move on and talk about happier things or look forward to things or look talk about things getting back to normal. But for people and for society, it helps us to heal when we are able to acknowledge and talk about what happened. And part of what has happened in the pandemic is that people have died and people have been scared. And that has been upsetting for a lot of people. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's normal to feel anxious and worried about this, you know. And yeah. this, this is part of what they're doing in their project is like understanding that that's quite normal, but adults don't like admitting that. And they will often say to children, like I'll say as a parent, yeah, let's tell you know, you've got to tell me if you're worried, you've got to tell me if you're upset. And then I won't tell them that I'm worried and upset, if you see what I mean. Because you try and keep everything and to some extent you can't share everything all the time, but you know, it is, but we don't like to admit we're vulnerable. I think that's part of the problem for adults. Don't yeah, like we, adults have a hard time admitting that they need other people and they need help too sometimes. Um, but everybody needs people, especially when things are tough. I'm thinking about everybody needs people. I'm thinking about, you know, people, you know, they come together in their classrooms and their communities yeah. and families. Uh, there's a certain way of thinking, isn't there? There's a way of remembering things that you call collective memory. Um, yeah. And I think you sort of define about how we all think about things. And, and this is really important. Why, why do you think it's so important to, to talk about, you know, to, to talk about things like grief and how we feel and anxious, 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 I'll say it, anxiety 
that kind of thing because you know what how will it help us move forward with, with sharing our memories mm. of our well a lot of what the university research shows is that if we don't talk about it broadly speaking people are still sad and upset but they're not able to share that with the people around them which often means that they continue to be sad when coming together would be helpful but it also can mean that if we don't talk about it together and share our experiences and listen to other people's experiences that we don't always remember what has happened the same way and that can make it harder to resolve conflicts but it also can make it harder for us to decide what we want to do together going forward, whether it's preparing so that we're better prepared for health emergencies or thinking about plans for going back to school. <laughs> if we don't have the same understanding of what happened, it's much harder to move forward together. And thinking about remembering people and remembering people who've died, who've been sick, health workers, but also this period in general, I mean, how how do people remember what do you you know how how do you think people should remember is there a way of remembering or is there lots of them oh there's so many ways of remembering i think there's a way that we remember collectively which is all together and the way we could say society remembers events it's sort of what we kind of agree all together happened um it's a bit like how in your in your family, there might be stories that get told so much, you feel you remember them, even though the events in the story might have happened before you were born or when you were really, really little. That's sort of the collective memory of, of, of what, what happened in your family. And eventually we will have, eventually the pandemic will be over and we will have a collective memory about what has happened during COVID-19. And that's why I think this project you're doing for school is so cool because you're going to help us remember that the diaries you're producing and the pictures you're producing and the things you're thinking are going to be part of that big collective memory. In a more personal sense or private sense, as you're saying, Debbie, there's no one way to remember. Everyone is able to remember in their own way and and in their own time. Um, and so I can give some suggestions, but I don't have a, a recipe <laughs> for the best or the only way to remember. Um, but I think things that are helpful to think about are for people who have died or been sick, it's important or useful often to remember what they like to do the people they loved, the funny things they said, how many pets they had, to remember their lives and, and who they were to the people that loved them rather than the circumstances of their death, which is COVID-19. It's often really useful to focus on the, on the person who decides life. Um, it's also, I think, useful to think about remembering in a variety of ways, right? So for, for ourselves, we might talk to our friends and family, we might look at pictures, we might make videos, we might draw pictures. When it's safe, we might go to a place that is important and meaningful to us to just think about the pandemic and sort of take stock of everything that has happened and to be quiet and reflect for people who belong to faith communities, going to places of worship, like a church or temple or gurdwara or mosque or synagogue can often be a good place to remember. But there are as many ways as you can think of. There, there are ways to remember, there, there is not a wrong way. And do you think, I mean, obviously we're talking about you know, thinking about a national remembrance of some yeah. kind of like Remembrance Sunday. Yeah. Which happens on 11th of November and we, you know, we, we wear poppies and we put wreaths on monuments and that kind of thing. Um, and the, obviously we talked a little bit in the last term about the influenza epidemic and how there's no mm -hmm. memorial. Yeah. 
Um, and even if the government put up a memorial that, I mean, it doesn't have to be a fancy or permanent memorial, does it? I mean, it's, everybody remembers in their own way. So, I mean, what, what do you want to finish with just to say to the, to the group today? I think one of the key things to keep in mind about remembrance and memorialization is that it doesn't have to be permanent. It doesn't have to be a statue. It doesn't have to be a plaque. Those things are nice, but they are not the only way to remember. We don't need to ask permission for remembrance. The government is not the only institution or place in our lives that engages in remembrance. All remembrance matters. And so if you want to memorialize the pandemic or a person who died within your family or your community or your school, you can do that. And that is just as important as the types of fancy remembrance we might be a little more familiar with. Everyone is allowed to participate in remembering. Thank you. Thanks very much for sharing that information and, and your research with us. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate. This has been a real pleasure.